Let's continue our discussion on dual vectors by discussing some important mathematical rules and properties of dual vectors, which will eventually lead us to define something called a metric tensor. But before we begin, let's recall some important concepts from the last video, namely the definition of a dual vector as it pertains to tensor analysis. I do encourage you to watch that previous video because it'll define the dual vector and give you some valuable intuition. In the context of tensor analysis, a dual vector d is an operation on the contravariant vector v that returns the inner product of v and the vector d that corresponds to the dual vector d. It takes a vector, a contravariant vector, spits out the dot product, which is a real number, and it's also a linear function because the dot product is a linear operator. This is consistent with what we want from a dual vector. I'll call this definition of the dual vector equation 1. In the last video, I also demonstrated how intuitively a dual vector d applied to an input vector v results in a quantity that tells us how much of the dual vector d we crossed as we went from the start of the vector v to the end of the vector v. And by comparing this to the gradient vector, which is a specific example of a dual vector, I concluded that a dual vector d is described by covariant vector components d sub i, where i varies from 1 to n, n being the dimension of the space we're in. Typically, we can write a dual vector as a row vector with the elements d sub i. And notice that I'm using the underline to distinguish a dual vector from a regular vector for which I'm using an arrow on top. Now, in contrast to the dual vector, the vector v is given by the contravariant vector components v super i, where i again varies from 1 to n. Note that with contravariant vector components, we use the superscript to index them as opposed to the subscript. A regular vector like v, as you probably know, is written typically as a column vector. So if I have a dual vector d expressed in terms of this row vector, and a regular vector v expressed in terms of this column vector, the simplest way of calculating the dual vector operation is to straight up do a matrix multiplication of the row vector for d and the column vector for v. And when you end up doing this calculation, you get d sub 1 times v super 1 plus d sub 2 times v super 2 plus all the way to d sub n times v super n. You can compress this long sum on the right hand side using Einstein notation and writing it as d sub i times v super i where i is the dummy index that's being summed over. It's being summed over because it's repeated twice. I'm going to call this equation 2. Let's do a quick example with some numbers. If I have a dual vector given by the row vector 1, 1, and a regular vector given by the column vector 2, 3, then d of v is just the product of the row vector and column vector, which will turn out to be 1 times 2 plus 1 times 3, which is just 5. Staying with this example, you might be familiar with another way to calculate the dot product of a dual vector and a vector, which you probably use very liberally in linear algebra. What you would do is convert the row vector, the dual vector, to a column vector like this, which I'll call d with an arrow on top, just by taking the simple transpose of the dual vector d. And once you did that, you would multiply the corresponding elements and sum the results together to get your dot product. But there's a big problem with this method. The problem is that if I've got a dual vector d given by 1 and 1, then in general I can't just convert it to its corresponding regular vector just by taking the transpose. I can only do this if I'm in Euclidean space in a rectangular coordinate system with an orthonormal basis. But if I'm in a non-Euclidean space or if my basis vectors aren't orthonormal like your regular ijk vectors, then I can't just go from a dual vector to a regular vector with a simple transpose. I need to apply additional operations. And to see what those additional operations look like, let's go back to this dot product form for the dual vector d applied to the regular vector v. I'll call this equation 3. Now let's suppose that I can write the vector analog of the dual vector d with these contravariant components d super 1, d super 2, all the way to d super n. Our vector v is already expressed in terms of contravariant components v super 1, v super 2, and so on. I can rewrite this equation by bringing in my basis vectors and re-expressing my d and v vectors in terms of this algebraic expression, with the linear combination involving the individual components and the basis vectors e sub 1, e sub 2, and so on, corresponding to those components. This is very similar to how we would write any regular vector, so something like 2 and 3 can be written as 2i plus 3j, where i and j are essentially my basis vectors e sub 1 and e sub 2 in the two-dimensional rectangular coordinate system. 
So if I now go back to my general equation for the dot product, I've got this dot product between these two linear combination algebraic expressions. Now because the dot product is a linear operation, that's the whole point of a dual vector, then I can expand out this dot product and distribute it over addition like so. I can then rewrite this giant right hand side as a summation over the index i and j like so. Now because i and j are repeated twice in the expression involving the summation, I can get rid of these sigma symbols and using Einstein notation end up with this expression for my dot product, the d super i times v super j times the dot product of the basis vectors e sub i and e sub j. We'll call this equation 4. Let's now copy paste our equation 2 and rewrite our equation 4 here. You can see that equations 2 and 4 just represent different ways of calculating the same thing, the output you get when you apply the regular vector v to the dual vector d. And because these two equations ultimately give you the same output, their right hand sides must be equal, obviously because the left hand sides are the same thing between equations 2 and 4. And when we equate the right hand sides you get something which I'll call equation 5. Let's analyze this equation. When I've got an orthonormal basis, meaning that each basis vector has a magnitude of 1 and is perpendicular to all other basis vectors, then the dot product of the basis vectors e sub i and e sub j becomes 1 when i and j are the same, and it becomes 0 when i and j are different from each other, when they represent different basis vectors. When this is the case, when I've got an orthonormal basis, the right hand side of equation 5 will always be 0 unless i equals j, in which case the dot product is 1 and we can replace the index j on the right by the i to get the following. Now, the v super i's cancel on both sides because they represent the exact same contravariant vector components. When we do this, we reach the conclusion that in an orthonormal basis with rectangular coordinates in Euclidean space, the components of the dual vector d are equal in value to the components of the corresponding regular vector d with the arrow on top. What this means is that if I've got a dual vector d given by 1 and 1 as a row vector, then to go from this d to its corresponding column vector d with the arrow on top, I just take the simple transpose of the original row vector. Now just to be clear, this equation doesn't mean that the dual row vector of d and the regular column vector of d are equal, it just means that their corresponding components are equal, so you can convert between the two with the simple transpose. Let's now go back to equation 5 and consider a more general scenario. What if I'm not in a Euclidean space, or if my basis isn't orthonormal? Well, in that case, the dot product between the basis vectors e sub i and e sub j doesn't just go away when i isn't equal to j, and it isn't just equal to 1 when i equals j either. Instead, the dot product between these basis vectors can be written as another scalar quantity, another number, which I'll define as g sub i j. This g sub i j is a very important quantity that comes up in a bunch of other applications. It represents the i j component of a rank 2 covariant tensor called the metric tensor. An important property of the metric tensor is that it's a symmetric tensor, meaning that the components g sub i j equal the components g sub j i. In matrix terms, this just means that the matrix used to represent the metric tensor is equal to its own transpose. And this property should make sense because the dot product is commutative, so I get the same component g sub i j even when I switch the basis vectors being dotted. And by definition, the dot product of e sub j and e sub i is g sub j i, which means that because all these expressions are equal, g sub i j equals g sub j i. So if I plug this metric tensor component into equation 4, this is what I get for the dual vector d operating on the vector v. I can still use the contravariant version of the dual vector, so the d with the arrow, but then I have to multiply by the metric tensor components in addition. I'm going to call this equation 6. Let's now look at how we can convert between some vector a with contravariant components a super i and its corresponding dual vector, which I'll denote with a that's underlined and given by the components a sub i. Keep in mind that in general, every dual vector corresponds to a vector, and every vector corresponds to a dual vector. Now, in Euclidean space and rectangular coordinates, we just showed that we can easily go from a vector to its dual by taking the simple transpose, because the corresponding components between the row vector and the column vector are equal. But this simple process doesn't always work, and you need to apply some other operations if it doesn't always work. Let's now show what these other operations are. We'll consider the dot product of the dual vector a with its corresponding regular vector a. You know that you can write this in two ways. One way is by equation 2, and the other way is by using the metric tensor in equation 6.
Now these two right-hand sides are both equal to each other because they represent the same thing. And both of these right-hand sides contain the components a super i, so I can just cancel them out. This means that in order to convert from a regular vector a to its corresponding dual vector, I just multiply the components by the metric tensor corresponding to the basis of that regular vector a. And this is known as the process of lowering the index, to go from a contravariant vector to its corresponding covariant vector, to go from a top index to a bottom index, I just have to multiply by the metric tensor components corresponding to the basis I'm working in. And this is another reason the metric tensor is useful. It can be used to lower the index and convert regular vectors to their corresponding dual vectors. You might now wonder what you can do to quote unquote raise the index, so convert a dual vector to a regular vector. Now to describe that process, I need to define the inverse metric tensor. The inverse metric tensor, whose components I'll denote as g super ki, is a tensor which, when its components are multiplied with the components of the regular metric tensor g sub ij, gives you the Kronecker delta symbol, which is 1 when j equals k and 0 otherwise. In matrix terms, this basically means that the product of the matrix representing the inverse metric tensor and the matrix representing the regular metric tensor gives you the identity matrix, which makes sense. To get an index raising equation, we'll take my index lowering equation and multiply it by g super ki, the components of the inverse metric tensor. And when we do that, this is what we'll get. Now by definition of the inverse metric tensor, this term on the right just becomes the Kronecker delta symbol like so. And this Kronecker delta symbol is 1 when k equals j and is 0 otherwise, so the expression on the right hand side just reduces to a super k. This now gives us our index raising equation to go from a dual vector with the covariant components a sub i to the regular vector with the contravariant components a super k, we need to use the inverse metric tensor. And this is known as the process of raising the index, where we go from a dual vector with bottom indices to its corresponding regular vector with top indices. Anyway, that should do it for this video. In the next lesson, I'll describe the dual basis and work through some more examples. I'd like to thank the following patrons for their support, and if you enjoyed the lesson, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.